going to be our last live stream here on at the mic for 2023 a new year is ahead and thank you so much for making time i'm your host keith malinak here for at the mic and uh I wanted to sit down with a guy who I am just, I'm fascinated by how much knowledge he has. Uh, his name is Ed McCray, and he and I have been communicating uh, via email for probably a year or so now. He knows so much about Disney, the history there, um, the history of animation in general. And and he's just a wealth of knowledge with all things Walt Disney, Walt's uh, history, uh, the company's history, and what is happening today. And there is so much to talk about with Ed, and there's not a chance we get to all of it today, but we're going to try uh, to get a good start. So uh, with that said, uh, let me bring in Ed here. All right. Ed Hello. McCray. Hello. Hey, buddy. How you doing, man? <laughs> oh, I, I'm fine. <laughs> Thanks for making time on a Saturday morning. I really appreciate it. Well, they, it. they don't have Saturday morning cartoons anymore, so what else can we do? <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about uh, cartoons. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I just introduced you here to the audience, uh, and, and I'm just fascinated by how much you know about Walt Disney and the history of the company Let's before we get into that, give the audience a, a little bit uh, uh, of your background and how you became so, I guess, fascinated with yeah. Walt in, in his creations. Well, that all started. I was born at the right time because uh, when I I was born in 1980, and around that the time I was aware of things, that's when the cable companies started, and they were airing all this old vintage stuff, and. We got we were one of the first people that got the Disney Channel, and they would show Walt's old TV shows. And you know, to a little kid, you, you didn't realize that these were filmed decades ago, and he passed away. And when he would be there talking about all these different topics, you felt like he was talking to you. And and on the Disney Channel at the time, they would show the old uh, movies and the old cartoons. And I, I grew up on this stuff. And they they would also show. Um, the Mickey Mouse Club, the original one from the 50s. They, I remember having a dinner and it would be on. And uh, all, all everything that would, they would just, and it was all new to, to anything like that is new to a kid. And uh, n now people are like, well, this stuff's old. We need new things and don't bother with the past. And uh, that, it gets neglected. And with um, other cable channels and things. I, I grew up watching the, the Hanna Barbera cartoons. That was they were popular in the seventies, but I didn't know that they were just showing them all the time. <laughs> and then there was a Nickelodeon at that time. They it, once it was eight o'clock, they would show old TV shows. It, it was called Nick at Night. And uh, I, in elementary school, I'd, I'd watch things like like Get Smart and uh, Dick, the Dick Van Dyke Show. And uh, Saturday mornings back then, they would show the original Dennis the Menace that was in black and white. And they would show F. Show. They would show F Troop. Now they would never show that now because of the Akawi Indian tribe, and uh, it, you know, well, in that was all done in fun. It wasn't done. You know, everything today, everybody gets all offended by. And, and the Akawi Indians were supposed to be the lost tribe of Israel. That's why they were all Jewish actors in uh, F Troop. Oh, <laughs> by the way, by the way, by the way, yeah, I think yeah. one of your friends has called you um, Ed Cyclopedia. Because yeah. you have all of this knowledge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was coined. I was uh, friends with some of the uh, Sherman Brother people. And they wrote the songs for Disney. And they coined that. They always coined the words in the songs. And uh, the son of one of them started calling me the Ed Cyclopedia. Because of all of my knowledge. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, so where did you... Did you ever have this, this moment where you said, Oh my gosh. I am a Disney geek, you know, and well, I never thought of it that way. I just, okay. Did, I just, did you ever, did you ever decide, did you ever say, I'm going to make it a point to know all of this stuff. And then you, then you consciously went out and tried to absorb it or did it just all just natural? A lot of it was natural, but, I, but I think it was the first topic I was really interested in like that. But when I'm doing my own original projects, I do a lot of research and a lot of my friends in animation, they say that they've never seen anyone that becomes an expert in what they're working on like I do. I've been working on this thing with American folklore. 
and I've been acquiring all the old folklore books. Just even though I've got my story, I've been putting in little details of things that were from the original folk tales. And uh, you know, it, it, just, it, that's it, man. I mean, in correspondence with you, it, <laughs> it became so obvious to me that you have so much knowledge that needs to be shared, and that's why I wanted to have you here on the podcast to give you that outlet, so that I I'm not you know, uh, selfishly hogging you to myself. <laughs> I want everybody to, 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 to get this understanding about all this helpful information that, you know, that's just so much of it, Ed, that you have shared is mind blowing. And, and I think that's what we're going to do. I don't know if it's going to be three conversations. I don't know if it's however going to be many 20, it takes 20 <laughs> conversations, but, but we need to squeeze out all of this correspondence that we have yeah. had over the year. So and 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 give it to the people. So well, some of my some of my friends have said that uh, they were making the films when I was growing up. Uh, they said I'm like the, the la one of the last people of the of this generation that learned all this stuff, so it'll carry on for later. Because now it's all being destroyed, and and the people that are getting into animation, they're not interested in this stuff. It's like Disney's become like a religion to a lot of the Disney fans. If you see how they have their podcasts and things. It, mm. It's they don't when, when you the people that made the original films back in the 30s and 40s, not just Disney, but everywhere, even the people that did the comics for Marvel in the 60s, they read the classics, they knew history, they knew all these high concepts and things. And today, people don't read those things and they want to cancel all that stuff. I, I mean, uh, you're right, man. You used to read these books in school, and uh, there, there's a lot of the films that Walt Disney made, they were based on. Uh, the classics that kids would read in school, and some of those movies have been banned now. There was one in the fifties, a live action movie called uh, "Light in the Forest," and every kid read this book. And it's it's about a boy who was raised by Indians, and he finds the biological family, and he has to choose between if he's going to stay an Indian or if he's going to uh, go back with his family and in the different cultures and everything. And that's why it's banned. <laughs> but uh, everyone read this book back in schools, and it. And and uh, we'll get into some things later that with books, but uh, the, the, he kept a lot of the stuff alive for the next generation. But through his films, a different medium is a lot of the stuff was the first time it was dramatized. He like he did when he did Treasure Island. Uh, that was the second time I think it was made in a talking film. But so much of what we think of what a pirate is is based on John Newton playing Long John Silver in that mm -hmm. film. They never said R or matey or any of that stuff until Robert Newton was Long John Silver. And he was so popular, uh, without Walt, there was a sequel made in the 50s and a TV series with him. It was done in Australia. But it, it, and that was a thing where he was ahead of his time, too, because there wasn't a telev television then. And uh, Robert so Newton did, just became... How, how did Walt himself get into animation and and... What were his beginnings as, well, as he sought out to basically really change America for the better? Well, that's really what his whole uh, life was, was everything built on everything else. He started out in the Midwest. And uh, the story they always tell about how his becoming an artist, how starting out with art, was uh, there was a barrel of tar next to his parents' house. And he talked to his little sister. They drew pictures on the side of the house. And uh, they said, oh, it'll just wash off. Well, it didn't wash off. And uh, <laughs> what his aunt found out about that and got him some art supplies. But where he really decided to become an artist was um, it's a it's kind of a Christmas story, you know, like Ralphie and the BB gun. He wanted a pair of boots. And uh, they, you, when you look at old movies like It's a Wonderful Life and everything, what it was like in the 1900s, early 1900s, that's what those films show. So you've got to think about this is what the world was like then. With the 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 buggies going by and the, right. the, the kid, you know, so they, well the style was they wore boots and, and his family was really poor and his mother and his bro older brother Roy they saved up money for these uh, steel tip boots and he would deliver newspapers for his, his dad had a newspaper uh, route you bought the route and then you'd hire the newsboys to deliver them and he'd have to get up at four thirty in the morning and go deliver these papers we had these boots on and in the middle of winter he started kicking some ice in the street. And uh, there was a horseshoe nail in the street that got through the boot into his foot. And so he was down for three weeks and there wasn't, there's no radio, there's no TV. And, and he read a little bit. They were poor, so they didn't have a lot of stuff, but
but uh, one of their neighbors gave him some drawing supplies and paper and things. And that's when he, they say that's when he decided to become an artist was because he, he was probably about 13, 14, something like that. And even, even though he'd always drawn things, he, he drew a picture of a horse for the, the, his, the family doctor and they, he bought it for a quarter. And uh, that, but that's how the uh, artistry they say got started was because he had this downtime. Then his father was a very uh, practical guy, and and uh, he thought it was kind of strange with the art and all that. And <laughs> but he got it. He got art Walt art lessons, and uh, that all that kind of built. Cool. That is so he, he he basically went through his own uh, lockdown. <laughs> yeah, three weeks. Well, I I did too when I was sixteen. I had a hernia operation, and and uh -huh. I I did my first story, good story over that. Yeah, you know? yeah, <laughs> and and that's one thing I do want to point out is that you are an animator as well now. Well, uh, I'm more I, in in the story section. That's what I'm really good at is the story part, story okay. and characters. I've always been the story and character guy, and, more, and more so than actually drawing the and the moving characters. But I understand all that. Is Jill Chill? That is your. Um, that was my sig signature character, and and Jill that was designed to be an animated film. But that was that was because when I was in high school, I noticed no one made Christmas specials like they used to in the sixties and seventies, and I wanted to see if I could do it. And I came up with this Jill Chill character, and I tried to make something timeless like that. And I had built puppet sets and stop motion puppets in my grandfather's barn. And I was doing this all through college. And then I got a deal to do a book with it. And I started d doing print media. And that kind of worked out, too, because I have learned with the way the animation industry is now, I'd rather be doing the book thing because I'm able to put everything that I want to put into it, into the story. I don't have all these uh, PC executives wanting to appeal to this demographic and that demographic. We can't say this because it might offend somebody and they just micromanage everything to death. And that's one reason uh, films are the way they are now. They, they just worry about stuff. It doesn't matter. Can I, can I hold up? I was just going through my yeah. emails here. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Can, can I hold up a picture of uh, Jill chill? Well, sure. Um, yeah. I think this is her, right? These are some uh, concept art things that we've been right. working on. Yeah. That was, we're, we're yeah. doing some concept things to uh, see if what it would look like to, to pitch it as, as a film again. And who's Jack. Oh, Jack Frost. Yeah, Jack Frost. Okay. We'll see the old Christmas specials. They'd always use characters like uh, you'd always have Santa Claus show up and Mrs. Claus and all that. So you you always have some of the established characters from folklore with your original characters. I was the Dude, first person. Awesome. I was the first person that uh, put uh, characters like Mother Nature, Father Time, and the Sandman on a council in a Christmas thing. Now the Santa Claus too did that, but I was published first. I, and the reason I did it was because I was on the, I made, I made a list of all those kind of characters and there were, I ended up with 12 of them and I was on a town council at the time right out of high school. So that's what, what are you going to do with 12 people? Will you put them on a town council? <laughs> hold, hold on, hold on. Here is uh, Krampus. You can't yeah, have a Christmas story without Krampus. We're gonna, that's, I'm working on doing a little uh, Christmas story with uh, Jill Chill for, for this coming year. We're going to try to bring her back now. She's been on hiatus for a long time. And it, okay. it's going to have uh, Mr. Krampus in it. Uncle Krampus. Okay. <laughs> oh, awesome. You know, you are, um, I, I think it's fair to say, kind of the David Barton of animation <laughs> history. Yeah, well. I think that, that, that's what I'll call you. I seem but, to occupy that space. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk more about um, Walt. And he discovers after his three-week uh um, uh, laying up there in the bed with the foot injury. Uh, he discovers this talent that he has, this gift. What happens then? Like, how does he, I guess, eventually start his company? Well, that, that there, we there's a couple of other things that happened before that because uh, he also uh, went and he wanted to be in World War One, And, you know, that was going on at the time, but he was too young to be in the military. And he found out about a Red Cross unit that would accept 17-year-olds. Uh, so he got his mother to sign the permission form, and then he changed the year he was born on the form. And he was an ambulance driver in France during the end of, the, of uh, World War I. And wow. he drew pictures all over the side of his ambulance. And uh, he would submit cartoons to newspapers and things in the United States, but they would deny them. They, you know, he, he didn't get a break at that time. But uh, he also... Um, when he was growing up, the other forms of entertainment, there was uh, vaudeville. And that's really where he learned how to do story. 
And what vaudeville was, it started in the mid 1800s in the United States. And you would have America was a cultural melting pot, you know, and there would be all these different ethnic groups that would they would do stage performances and stuff. There was no this was the appeal of it. There was nothing like this in the world because America is the only country that takes people from all over the world and they've made a cohesive society. And uh, they would they would do singing. Some of them, some of them would there would be magic acts, uh, comedy acts. A lot of the original performers you think of like Bob Hope and George Burns and Bing Crosby. They all came out of vaudeville, and they, they would they you just they would just travel around all these theaters all over the country and perform. And that was still going on when Walt was growing up. And uh, even things like like when you look at the of old films from other studios where they have things like blackface. People don't understand, they didn't just wear blackface. There was also white face, yellow face, uh, red face. They would do all the different races. But it was also people of those races would do it. There was, the, If you watch Casablanca, the piano player, you know, s s play it again, Sam. He mm -hmm. started out as a white face act playing an Irishman. <laughs> and and it, see, you don't ever hear this, this stuff. No. And, and, it, it, it was, and it wasn't to make fun of anyone, mo you know, most of it, because... Bing Crosby started out in blackface with a black jazz band because it wasn't acceptable at the time for a white man to sing jazz. And they would, he would, and when he became famous, Bing did, huh. he brought a lot of those performers with him. Like, and the most famous one we still know now, Louis Armstrong started with Bing Crosby doing this vaudeville circuit. That's so, I mean, cool. this wasn't, th these people back then, they weren't racist like we're told now. It was a, there were different standards and it was a different time, but we should try to understand what why things were the way they were instead of well they just wore blackface so they must all be racist and right. they they have uh, where they have the digital copies of the films. My copy of Holiday Inn, the Bing Crosby movie, the Blu-ray and the DVD, it had all these features about Bing Crosby, Irving Berlin, and um, Fred Astaire. And those were on the digital version, but I noticed last year they th wiped all those away, and now all that's there is a four-minute section about how they were all racist because there's a, a blackface number. And there was, there's a lot more context. Bing Crosby was also called the first hip white man in America. <laughs> and he, he worked for Walt Disney. He did uh, a couple of shorts. He narrated, and he also did the Legend of Sleepy Hollow section and Ichabod Mr. Toad. And what worked oh. with all these people, you know, so they, everything's connected. <laughs> to I, Disney. I <laughs> okay. So, so Walt goes over to world war one. Yeah. Uh, and then where does his story go from there? After that, he, he came back to Kansas city where the family was and, uh, he rented a camera and they would him and his friends, they would just goof around with the camera and they would do things like the reverse, the film or, uh, 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 just camera tricks. It, uh -huh. it, I'm trying to think what we, we could compare it to what kids would do today with, with uh, you know, the digital and all that. It, they, they were just goofing around making these little uh -huh. films. And then uh, there was, back then there were studios that would uh, draw illustrations for uh, newspapers and things. And he got a job there. And uh, that's where he met Ub Iwerks. And he was with him for uh, most of his career. This is, this is Ub. He was oh, the co-creator wow. of Mickey Mouse. Uh -huh. And, uh, He's really the Nikola Tesla of animation, but uh, it was just amazing there that they, they were in the same place at the same time, rural America, and uh, the first company Walt started was uh, called the Laughagram Company, and they would do uh, animated cartoons of some of the fairy tales set in modern times, and it ended up uh, going bankrupt, and what Walt did then was he, uh, the money they had left, he did a, uh, he started doing the most a, a extravagant film he could do where he mixed a live action girl in a cartoon world. And it was called Alice's Adventures in Wonderland or Cartoon Land, but it was loosely based on Lewis Carroll. At the time, there there were other studios where they would put the cartoon in 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 the real world, like Coco the Clown. Uh, that was a, the Fleischer Brothers who did. Uh, they're known now for Betty Boop and Popeye and the Superman cartoons. Right. Um, but th they did Coco the Clown in 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 the real world. So he put a girl in a cartoon world. And eventually, uh, Walt moved out to Hollywood with the unfinished film. And uh, first, he tried getting jobs at studios. He really wanted to be a live-action director. And he couldn't get a job as a live-action director. So uh, he 
uh, rented uh, the garage of his uncle that lived there, and he finished this film and he sold it to uh, a distributor in New York. And then, then uh, he went to his brother. His Roy was his older brother, and it's, it was really the Disney Brothers Studio. And Roy had tuberculosis and was in a hospital. And Walt came to see him and said, "said You had to have to come. He has to come in with him because." He sold uh, the rights to this uh, new series, and he needed a guy in charge of the finances. And that was really Roy's gift. And uh, Roy left the sanitarium, and they started the Disney Brothers Studios, and then he, he sent for Ub Iwerks. And also who started with Walt were um, Frizz Freeling. He went on to do Looney Tunes. Yosemite Sam's based on him as a character. And there was... Uh, well, yeah. And uh, there was... Uh, 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 I got to find. I always want to get. The, I always mix the names up here. Uh, Hugh Harmon and Rudolph Ising, and they started the Looney Tunes before Freeling. It was they did Bosco the 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 boy. He, that was the first Looney Tune character. Okay. You ever, then they had Buddy, and then after that they Bugs Bunny and those. They didn't come around until the late forties. Uh, the first okay. big character for Looney Tunes was Porky Pig, and you oh. you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that. And even Bugs Bunny has roots with Disney because Disney did a silly symphony cartoon of the tortoise and the hare. And the Looney Tunes guys liked this hair character that was a wisecracking hair. And they started experimenting with putting that in their own cartoons. And that eventually became Bugs Bunny. But that was inspired by a short that Walt did. But all, the, all these guys that were in all these other studios, they all started with Walt in his studio. And he originally didn't get into animation because animation at that time was all centered in New York City. And he didn't think he could uh, compete with them because they... They'd been around. If you look at up some of these films of what they would do for animation back then, they were very limited, crude things in the nineteen teens. Because that's really when he started. Because we're doing the uh, they're doing the hundredth anniversary of the Disney Company now, and this is <laughs> it's really yeah. the it's really the from the Alice comedies. I haven't seen all of the Alice comedies. They've only put out a couple of them on official releases, and they they did those for about three years. That when they were first run, and. Uh, then the distributor, he, uh, her, it was her name was Margaret Winkler, and she married uh, uh, this other guy. And he uh, told them to uh, we have to do something else because this, the Alice comedies run its course. And uh, they came up with Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Right. And yeah, and that, this is where Oswald came into the story. And then uh, what ended up happening? They were doing that for a year, and uh, Winkler and her husband Charles Mintz, they. Uh, hired all the animation staff away from Walt and they were trying the, the distributor owned the characters back then. It wasn't the creator that owned them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they hired all the staff out from under Walt, except for Ev Iwerks. And, uh, on the way back, uh, on the train, he rode the train with his wife back to uh, California. And he came up with this idea to do a mouse character because when one of, at one of the points when he was starting out, uh, uh he, uh, there was this mouse that would come into the studio and this is what inspired the mouse. Oh, really? And, yeah. And he, he named the mouse Mortimer, but his wife didn't like the name. And so <laughs> she told, call Mickey. And, but I don't think Walt actually designed Mickey on that train ride. And some people, I think what more likely happened, he had the idea. He came back with a uh, by works and they brainstormed designing Mickey. Either you, some of the books will have a picture that's known as Mickey's birth certificate, where it's got all these different, sketches and there, there were Ub Iwerks that did them and Ub would secretly animate these cartoons on his own while they, they had to finish the contract with Oswald and get all those guys out of the studio and they didn't want him to mm. rip them off so oh. the, the first few Mickey Mouse cartoons Ub Iwerks animated all by himself and the very first one that was animated was Plain Crazy and, and it wasn't the first release Steamboat Willie was the first release but it was the third one animated the second oh. one was The Galloping Gotcho was it, was he, well, I, that, I know that fact, but everyone goes Steamboat Willie, so that's what people believe is the fact, but it was really the third one animated. And you've seen some of these I've sent you that with yep. many, Mickey would snap Minnie's underwear <laughs> and do all these little rascally things. He well, was I mean, a jerk, as, as uh, somebody mentioned, uh, Wombat Mommy mentioned, you know, the original Mickey was a jerk. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he was a rascal, and there's one of the early Mickeys where he breaks out of a prison with a bunch of other characters, and oh, yeah, I, always, I always wanted to know, what did Mickey Mouse do to end up in prison? Because you have to do something really bad to end up in a prison. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and these, uh, and, and 
I don't know. If there are YouTube links or something like that, uh, do everyone a favor. Um, well, first of all, let me back up. Everyone do yourself a favor and follow on Twitter at real underscore Ed underscore McCray. Real Ed McCray. Uh, his handle is there on the screen. And Ed, if you don't mind, maybe later today, as a point of reference, these cartoons yeah, um, I can't. I can't remember. Were these links, or did you send them as attachments? I forget. No, they were links. And, okay, and good. I should mention uh, the first year of Mickey's are going to be public domain January first. So, oh, oh, oh Monday, <laughs> huh? Yeah. So oh, if you Monday. can do whatever you want with those first cartoons, I guess. But that, that, that's wild. that's really the only thing that's going to save all this history is it going into the public domain because that's what saved films like It's a Wonderful Life, and then they yeah. became oh, classics because. People saw what they were and how special and I, they were. And I don't want to derail the conversation into into It's a Wonderful Life here, but but I just recently, you, you mentioned that, and I just recently read something about how, I guess, a clerk or something um, messed up the mm -hmm. paperwork for yeah. that movie, and, and that's how it is airing everywhere now? Well, not now, because they, they went in and uh, got the copyright restored because um, – the Alfred Hitchcock film Rear Window, which also starred Jimmy Stewart, it was based on a shorter sh a sh story, and someone went in and they got that. That was going to go public domain, and they copyrighted the story, so then they said the film is a derivative work, so it's got to be copyrighted now. And that's what happened with This Wonderful Life, in short. But this also will, it ties in with what we're talking about now, because it was Frank Capra who discovered Walt Disney, and he did that. Yeah. Well, well, Walt made, made, Steamboat Willie was the first sound film. With mm -hmm. cartoons. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the very first sound film. They were experimenting with sound at other places, and they were doing live action. The first live action film with sound is regarded as the jazz singer. And that one's kind of banned now because it's about a, a Jewish performer and, and his family ha having uh, their budding heads. He wants to be a performer, and he does blackface on stage, the, the mammy and all that. If you ever see the old cartoons where someone, you know, they, they wave, wave their arms and go, mammy. That is from Al Jolson that was the star of that. He was known for that. It's not That wasn't really a ra thing to be racist, prejudiced, whatever. That was a reference pop culture. But uh, when, when they did the sound for Steamboat Willie, they couldn't uh, mix sound like they do now. And they had to do that whole thing live with the sound effects and the music and everything in a room. And they had to run through the whole thing. That's how they had to do things like that back then. And... Uh, uh, he, he, Walt went to all the studios with his sound cartoon. It was Frank Capra that uh, he he saw Walt and he thought this was a great thing with the sound. And that Columbia was the first distributor. And uh, Capra was always a friend of Walt, and he always put references to Walt in some of his later films. And you can't take it with you. Whistle while you work is played for one of the segments, and th that was a brand new song at the time. And it, Meet John Doe. Most of us have probably seen Meet John Doe. They sing uh, "High Diddly D" with the uh, harmonica, the Colonel and uh, John Doe on the train, and that was—I think it was—it was either the year Pinocchio came out or sh the year after. And in it, it's a wonderful life. Here's the reference that everyone misses now: in Martini's Bar, where the Italian singers are singing, the woman was the voice of Snow White, Adriana Casalotti. <laughs> wow! Wow! Okay, so just, I mean, you are a wealth so, so, of we Knowledge. didn't go off track because it does tie yeah. in with Disney and it came at the appropriate it. time. <laughs> so, so, okay. Um, uh, you've taken us through, uh, the Oswald, the rabbit and, and the first few, uh, Mickey cartoons. What is next for the Disney brothers? They did uh, the silly symphonies and who, whose idea that was, was Carl, uh, I think it was Carl Freeling. Um, he, he went on to do the music for the Looney Tunes and he wanted to do a, a series where they did songs. They wanted to do something besides Mickey because they'd already had Alice fail after so, so long and oh. they lost Oswald. So they had to start, you couldn't put all your eggs in one basket. Right. So the silly symphonies, they, uh, they were uh, a series where they would do, uh, uh, fairy tales or just funny little ideas and things. Some of them were, uh, in, uh, color. That's was the first series that went to color, actually, with uh, flowers and trees, and uh, those real were really the training ground for what the features became with Snow White and all that. And the Silly Symphonies, the the notable things with that, Donald Duck came out of a Silly Symphony. He was a character in the cartoon The Wise uh, Hen, and they had the voice for him first. And they came up with a character. What was it? This 
voice going to be, and it was Donald Duck, and he spun off into his own series. Uh, Goofy became a character because he was a, a side character of this yokel laughing in the audience of a cartoon, and he took off and became his own character. And those were really the, the four main series of the 1930s with Disney. And uh, th then they started to think about doing the feature-length uh, animated film. Now, oh, I also should mention The Three Little Pigs. That was a big... Uh, it was Carl Stalling was the guy's name that uh, was the music guy, by the way. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, the Snow White was the first. That was the first film. animated feature. And how we got to Snow White was, was first it was the Three Little Pigs that... Uh, it was a short film, but that was really considered the first time uh, they had full character animation where you believed in, in the character. And before that, if you look at all these films, how they all evolve into the later, you, you see how the, the style progresses. And that was really the... Everyone else was doing these crude black and white rubber hose animation things, and Walt was the only one that could do full color animation at the time. How cool. How cool. And uh, But the, then they did... Uh, they they, they was, built... Yeah, 1937, Snow White. Uh, yeah, that was Snow White, but remember it took the four years to make. God. And there was a lot of things before that that, that led into it. Uh, Ub Iwerks and Walt Disney had a falling out, and Ub went and founded his own studio. Uh, and uh, the falling out was, uh, Ub was really the art guy on that. And uh, they were at a party, and it was Ub and Walt, and uh, Walt made a comment to Ub, why don't you draw it, and I'll sign my name on it like we always do. And Ub didn't like that, and that's really where the rift started. And uh, the distributor that was doing the Mickey's then, he hired Ub away because everybody thought Ub Iwerks was the genius behind Walt Disney because he was the guy animating these, leading these. And we, I should also mention there was a Mickey Mouse comic strip. He started doing that as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Ub was the first guy drawing it. And I've sent you some of those, too, where Mickey would play Russian roulette, and that come out of the silent, the silent films because there were... Harold Lloyd and uh, Buster Keaton would do shorts where they would try to commit suicide and they would, you know, something would happen. <laughs> the, and the Deer Hunter starring Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, it would be like a comedy thing where it wouldn't, uh, it would always backfire on them with it and they ended up not dying, you know. And that, and he, Walt's background was also with the silent films when he was growing up. That was, that started coming through the, the vaudeville circuit, uh, and they were big fans of Charlie Chaplin back then. He was the, the I, I don't know who we'd compare him to now. He was really the first superstar, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and and eventually Charlie Chaplin became like a mentor to Walt Disney. So it was like his boyhood hero became his mentor. And eventually Charlie Chaplin was uh, locked out of the United States because he he made a film against capitalism. And when he went overseas to promote another film, they wouldn't let him back in the country. And they sold off his studio and everything. He never came back, only to to uh, receive a lifetime achievement Oscar in the seventies. What? Oh, oh yeah. It, I was totally not familiar with that. Ch Charlie Chaplin. Uh, he made. Well, everybody knows he did the Great Dictator, doing the film about huh? Hitler. Right. And uh, the, the, he did a couple films after that, and then he did this one about a banker who uh, he met. He would. He was. He had a family and was married and everything. I think the daughter was sick. It's been a while since I've seen this. But he, he needed more money. So he would uh, marry these wealthy widows, kill them, and take their money. And then when he got caught at the end of the movie, he gave a speech before they hung him about uh, capitalism made him do this. And uh, oh. e even when that happened to Charlie Chaplin, Walt Disney would defend Chaplin. He just got in with the wrong kind of people. He would still... I don't know if they ever reconciled or met after that. Walt would go to Europe sometimes. But Chaplin lived in Europe after that. And, that, and he just raised his family and everything there and he didn't really do very he wanted to do more films but he didn't really do that many he did a couple so man i thank you for blowing my mind with Charlie well, chaplin i I, was I didn't know we were going to go it. there but it just came no, out no i yeah. love it i mean bro see Cha chaplin started U united artists with uh uh douglas fairbanks and mary pickford and walt got in with them in the 1930s okay. and that, that's just like hollywood royalty Right, and eventually, right, right. eventually, RKO Pictures would distribute Walt's films, and that was owned by Howard Hughes. You know, the the airplane guy. I guess people would yep. know him for today. But and mm -hmm. eventually, in the fifties, uh, Howard Hughes offered to sell his studio to Disney, and they didn't want it, and he ended up selling it to uh, Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball, and that became Desi Lou that did all the sitcoms in the sixties and everything, Star Trek and all that. Uh -huh. But uh, uh -huh. and and 
and I should I should have mentioned with Chaplin, uh, his studio, it was the first uh, headquarters for filmation, and now it's the Jim Henson Studios. And they have a they have a statue of uh, Kermit dressed as Charlie Chaplin at the entrance there. Okay. <laughs> That's wow! It's all connected. Okay, so I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. We're we're just about up to World War II. Well, we have to. Go, there's a couple of films that came before World War II. You had Snow White. Uh huh. Well, well, when would Walt well, would he went to Europe and they they would they soaked in the culture. He sent all these books back from Europe of uh, things he might adapt into film, different kind of art things. There were several hundred of these books he sent back, and he met different pe people, leaders, and things in the countries and everything, and. Uh, he, that's where he first heard about Pinocchio, but and he hired some of the artists over there. And, the, and Snow White was really based with the artwork. It was based on a lot of the European uh, artists over there. He brought a couple over that did, all, you know, these these fancy renderings. And, yeah. uh, and that, by the way, I think if correct me if I'm wrong, Ed, uh, I think in a future conversation you're going to tell us what Snow White is really. Yeah, about, we'll, we'll go right? into the the film. This will be more of like an overview. But we'll go more in depth into these films. Sounds but uh, we're just getting like a timeline because I know most yeah. of the people here probably don't know the timeline. Uh, mm -hmm. But S Snow White was the first animated feature, and the the experts will point out well there were silent ones in the, in Argentina and in Europe. These but they weren't these lavish, full color musical extravaganzas like Snow White was. I mean, there'd never been an animated film like that. And and by the time that we got to Snow White, he had built his first studio, uh, and then. Uh, it was such a, a big success. They started designing and building a new studio for just for the artists and everything. I mean, it was where they were at before. It was more like um, everything was uh, all together and they were in little bungalows working and things. And uh, as they started shifting over to Pinocchio, they were working uh, at the new one and uh, Pinocchio uh, people don't associate it with 1939 remember these take four years to make uh in 1939 is considered the greatest year in hollywood history with all the films that came through and uh pinocchio was supposed to come out for that christmas but it he stopped the movie uh when they were in production because it wasn't working and they stopped for six months and they started over and uh before that pinocchio wasn't like a boy he was more like a wooden creature he they had to get him more like a human boy so people would get into this with Pinocchio. And huh. when you compare Snow White and Pinocchio, they're two very different stories. It's, it, it's the, the it, it's a whole different template. But uh, when, when Pinocchio came out, people didn't like Pinocchio because they thought it was kind of scary and too harsh and everything. Mm -hmm. It wasn't what it is now where it's, it's, a, it became a beloved classic and it cost a fortune to make. And, that's probably the finest animated film ever made because you remember all these, these films are all made analog. There's no digital or anything. So everything had to be done live. And the, the first five films, feature films they made, they all look like paintings through the whole movie. They, they, I mean, Snow White, they used real rouge on her cheeks. And uh, with, with Pinocchio, being, it was such a different, it was a radical difference from what they'd, always, they'd done before that. And uh, around the time when... Uh, Pinocchio was finishing up, there was a studio strike. And uh, the, the, with the studio strike, they were going after Walt for, uh, they would say that he wasn't fair to his employees and things, but if you look at what, if you read the testimony of the people that were there that were the strikers, the, this, the Disney studio, they uh, treated their uh, animators uh, more, better than the other studios. And that was really like uh, the the tech companies today were like Google and and all those where they had the campus and they'd have uh, they Disney had a gym they had a, a commissary where they didn't charge the employees they they had uh, all these things that had nothing to do with animation it's more like a college campus and there was the strike and then uh, that really uh, affected Walt where how his outlook was on everything because. Uh, he was always really close with the animators. They're just one of the guys. He was only about 10 years older than most of these animators. And they'd all, all the, the Great Depression was going on through all this time, the 1930s. So you have all these artists all across America. Where they, what are they going to do for an income? And they all came out to work for Walt Disney to make Snow White. And uh, so he offered this, them the, this opportunity. And he would get, he, to make Snow White better, he would bring in experts to give them lessons on, on the arts, how to draw like the classical masters and no, no other studio was doing that. 
And uh, he also, uh, if they, they would, he would let them take art supplies home and do their own stuff. And his, his brother Roy didn't like that. And, but Walt said, well, if they're doing their own stuff, they're becoming better artists, and he's ultimately going to benefit because that'll what they learn and their skills will work out in his films. And uh, in the, the strike, we can go into detail another time, but that really affected him. He because and, and you go back and look here. He lost his staff. He went bankrupt. He lost his staff on the first uh, studio. That then he has a strike, and he now, now he has a, a, a nervous breakdown <laughs> during this strike, and uh, they end up sending him uh, on a trip to uh, South America, and then that becomes a couple of films. While he's down there, he re researches for some films, but al also during the strike. Bob Iwerks studio had failed at that point, and he came back to see if he could work for Walt. And um, that really meant a lot to Walt Disney. He didn't, there's not really many uh, cases where somebody where he felt betrayed, where he forgave them. But Ub was crossing the picket lines coming to work for Walt again. He didn't want to work in animation. He wanted to work more on the technical side. And all of the things that Walt eventually did with live action, all those, those uh, fantasy effects and everything, Ub Iwerks invented all that. He re that's why I say he's really the Nikola Tesla of animation. Uh, when it was Snow White, they with Snow White they built the multiplane camera and it had all these levels and you could move the glass panes around and uh, it added a three dimensional look to the films. And uh, Ub Iwerks had invented something like that himself at his studio, uh, probably six years earlier, where he used car parts, but it was a vertical. Uh, horizontal and the other one was vertical and and uh but, uh, but this is i was way ahead of his time with this stuff and you just think well, what would these guys be doing now with all the digital technology you can do because they, they, they would think outside the box and everything and and, and Walt would say well why don't we why can't we do this in a film and uh people would figure out how to do it they wouldn't say that's well so we can't cool. we can't so do cool. that and, and, and you would when, when you talked about um, how long and arduous a process it was to create these animated films, uh, it, it, and you can test, we're going to test my Disney knowledge. This is the only fun fact I yeah. have to offer. And you tell me if this is accurate. I think the last uh, hand drawn uh, Disney movie was The Little Mermaid. Is that right? No, 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 no. That was when it started the Renaissance. The last one was Home on the Range. We didn't cover this, but. Uh, my whole life kind of uh, my parallels. One, my one contribution, and I failed, man. <laughs> we the the my life kind of parallels all this because uh, 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 Little Mermaid came out when I was nine years old. Okay, and so I learned a, a lot of this stuff with the Walt era. I learned up until then, and uh, at that time, uh, we would always watch things like the Disney Christmas Parade. And you can find these on YouTube. That somebody's archived all of them. You can see what all the parades looked like before the Little Mermaid. What characters were in the parades? And it was all the Walt era characters. And then Little Mermaid came out. And then you know that was a, a big sensation. And then after that, uh, the next big one was Beauty and the Beast. And then uh, there was Aladdin. And then the Lion King. And then it, then, then things started going off the rails. And and when I, those all came out when I was in, in elementary school. And when I was in high school, that's when they were doing things like Pocahontas, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Hercules, Mulan. And then, then I was in college, I think the year I graduated high school, uh, Tarzan came out. Hmm. So I'm in college, and then all these films start coming out like... Uh, I can't uh, wait till we really... Yeah, when we get to the Sierra. Because people might think, and, and not everyone, but I think the general consensus is that the Disney... Um, going off the rails, as you just alluded to, has been in recent years. It's been gradual. It's been a generation since since they were on the straight and narrow, right? Yeah, it, it, we'll we'll cover all. Yeah, this we'll, we'll cover that. So but, much to talk but, about. but the semester I graduated art school to be an animator to to do the, all this stuff, uh, that was a semester Disney shut down the hand drawn studio with Home on the Range. <laughs> okay, Home on so the my range. life. My life kind of goes through this, it, and ever since then we've been in the, like this uh, post-apocalyptic Disney thing where there'll be all all these. It, nothing makes sense anymore. All these weird things happen. Uh, right, right. Okay, so yeah. are, are we are we up to World War Two now, or am well, I just about? We okay. be, uh, after Pinocchio. Okay. After, after Pinocchio, Pinocchio came Fantasia. Okay. So in Fantasia, that that was also 1940, and that one uh, it it failed. And we'll talk more about that another time. But after Fantasia was Dumbo. 
And that was 1941, and it was supposed to be the big Christmas release of 1941. And what happens? The Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. And the next morning, uh, the military moves into the Disney studio because it was built to be a hospital in case they had to sell the buildings because there was a hospital across the street. And also it was close to Lockheed Martin, and they were there to protect that. And uh, that was the only studio in Hollywood where uh, the military moved on to, to the lot. And they, there was a, a commander that was living in Walt's office. And they had a hard time getting him to finally leave, <laughs> even after all the, the military moved out. And uh, Jack Warner of Warner Brothers was so terrified that the Japanese were going to come over and bomb his studio, thinking it was Disney's. He painted on the roof of all of the buildings. The Disney studio was over there. So if they came <laughs> flying over... <laughs> that's awesome i love that and, oh. with, and and now disney had lost all this money with pinocchio and fantasia and one of the reasons was the european market was shut off because of world war ii that really started world war ii in 1939 when hitler invaded poland and uh the, world war ii is really uh the the event that uh it changed everything for well, the whole world but also with disney because walt had all these films that he was going to make uh he bought the rights to and if you look at Pinocchio at the beginning where Jiminy Cricket's sitting by the book telling the story, you'll see books for uh, Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan there. Walt was going to make those movies, but he couldn't make them because uh, the money wasn't there now. And they were in a lot of trouble financially. And ended up do what they ended up doing was they uh, made films for the military. They would do training films, but then they also did uh, films for the home front with the characters. Uh, Donald Duck was enlisted into the army. <laughs> and a lot of the studios would do this with their characters. Uh, Popeye joined the Navy. And some of these cartoons, you can't, they ban them now because of the, the uh, ethnic stereotypes in the cartoons. But you got to remember with animation, a lot of it's caricature. So if you, you caricaturize something, and, and it's, it's always going to have a, a level of that there. And it's not necessarily done out of hatefulness. Some of them were, but a lot of them weren't. It was just, you're, you're, and you go all the way back to the silent era, and that's what it was like. America was the melting pot. All these cultures together, they would put them in. Even the comic strips, you would see a lot of uh, people dressed in the frock coats like the European Jewish people. And it wasn't mocking them or anything. Popeye had a character. His name was uh, Giesel, and he was a, a Jewish peddler character. But he wasn't, it wasn't mocking the character. He always tried to murder Wimpy. Wimpy tried to murder him. That was like the... <laughs> And one of the Popeyes in the comic strip, uh, Giesel puts rat poison in a hamburger and kills Wimpy. And he's, you know, and, right, and he's laughing right. as Wimpy dies. And and uh, the, the punchline of that Sunday continuity was uh, they had all this food in the kitchen. What are they going to do with it? And Wimpy come back from the dead to take care of the food. Wimpy was a mooching character. That's yeah. Yeah. That was his thing. But and, and all the all these characters, they all come out of the Great Depression. They were all these different things like that. It, and you got you got to look at the animated characters the same way. There was a lot of crossover. Popeye was a comic strip first, then he became an animated character. Mickey Mouse was an animated character, and he became a comic strip. And people, these comic strips were very popular. People would read them every day. And there wasn't home video back then or the internet. You couldn't watch the cartoons, so more people were familiar with the characters from the comic strips. And they they reprinted a lot of these uh, comic strips with Mickey Mouse. I think they've they've done from the beginning. I think up to the nineteen fifties. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, with the historical part of that, you get all these experts that write things about the history that don't really understand history. And one of them, they talk about American exceptionalism, and Mickey came out of that. But how they define American exceptionalism is white supremacy, and that's not what American exceptionalism is. No. But that's how academics have taught people that's right. what it was. It, it's not. What we know it is is. Uh, it empower the American ideals empower you to reach your fullest potential. And that's really what American exceptionalism is. It has nothing to do with race or anything like that. Absolutely. But, the, I, but the, I, these are the gatekeepers that are making the history books. And it's not just with anime. I mean, you, you know, they're doing it with the, the actual events in history. They're doing it in, in stuff that sh doesn't seem like it would matter, like animation. Right. I mean, right. It's, 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 they, they go after every, possible avenue of the culture and try to destroy it. I, I'm, and I'm there's, there's it. people that are historians, they at one time were for releasing all this vintage stuff and they've changed their tune that it all should be banned. And I don't know if it's because if they that's what the studios want now, so they want to have access to the studio vaults. So that's why they've changed 
wow. advocating to release all this historical stuff. And to me, I look at it as this is how things were back then. It's part of the culture. You you want to know what it was like in that culture. It, it's not. It, it, it's not sanitized stuff. I, I I like to see things as they were. And I've had some people in the elite group with animation and comics say, well, only racist people would want to look at that stuff. But it's part of what they uh, created back then. It's not right. advocating. History. You're not, Yeah, it's history. You're not advocating. Well, that, I think that's funny that they did that. You, you want to see what they did, why they did it. Right. Why were these things acceptable? Like what I said about blackface being part of all this melting pot stuff. It wasn't just mm -hmm. blackface. Uh, and and uh, I, I want to point out, uh, Wombat Mommy, thank you so much. I was racking my brain. I couldn't remember Wimpy's uh, line. Uh, I would gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Yes, thank you. That, that was his. <laughs> and, and, and the, you know, they made that into a live action film, and it's based up more on the comics than right. the cartoon. And yeah. people that know the comics, they, they like that film. And Wimpy had a song in it, but they cut it out. <laughs> oh, that's one of the earliest movies. Uh, what, what year did that come out? The live action I movie? think 1980. Movie. I mean, that's one of my earliest memories was, of the theater. It was Robin Williams' first big movie, and uh, the reason they made it was because the Superman movie with Christopher Reeve was so popular. Mm -hmm. And so they were looking for other comic book characters to do. And po that Popeye movie was a co-production with Disney. It was one of the first ones that they did with another company. Oh. It was Paramount and Disney. They did two with Paramount. The other one was a film called Dragon Slayer. And check this out. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I don't know yeah. that you know the answer to this, but CJ asks a question. What's the background on Tinkerbell? Well, which, which part would you like to know about the background? <laughs> I love this guy. <laughs> yeah, if y'all have questions, you know. It, it is a, it's, there. There's a myth that she was based on Marilyn Monroe, but Marilyn Monroe wasn't known at that time. Okay, okay. I mean, and it, with Tinkerbell, that we, we, you could talk about uh, Mark Davis was the animator on Tinkerbell, and he said he made her uh, face look more like a younger uh, woman and the body look like a woman. And so okay. it, would be ex it would be acceptable. Because it, 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 uh, be, in the 1930s and 40s, you'd have cartoons like Red Hot Riding Hood, and that was more like a Jessica Rabbit type character. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and that that uh, Tinkerbell and, and the Disney one, uh, that was the second time she was ever shown as being a fairy. She was always a pool of light on stage. Then, now Walt bought the rights to the silent film, and it was bought. It was worked on with with Sir J M Barry himself, and uh, that's why you haven't been able to see that. It's on Blu-ray now. Uh, I have that one. <laughs> it's and that many, one. Is, okay. How many books do you think you have? And uh, how uh, many DVD slash Blu-rays are in your collection? Th Ed? Thousands. <laughs> and I've I've tried to do a digital backup of some of the DVDs and things because some some people say they they will eventually rot eventually. Yeah. You know, it's not uh, timeless. Yeah. So I want to have a. I have so much of this vintage stuff. I want to have a backup. And sometimes people will post. Uh, vintage stuff that they won't officially release i'd buy the official releases if they put them out so i'm always downloading uh, there's a youtube channel that's putting out a lot of this stuff that walt did on television then a lot of it you can't get on disney plus and it's because it's pro america or it's it's and or the, there's something in it they won't like but in walt doesn't get credit for this but uh, a lot of his live action projects had american indians in them as stars he would hire tribes to come and be in the films and they would Make sure they were doing their the, the tribes took you know they took it upon themselves to do the customs and things of their people to make it accurate. It, what, I mean, who does things like that at that time in the fifties? So I know that one of your um, pet projects, and I absolutely love this, is to see Song of the South nominate basically in the um, National Film Registry. Yes. Because that would force, as you say, the Disney company to acknowledge that film. That yeah, is one of those films that uh, is is being erased from our history. And it's getting so ridiculous. Uh, a few years ago, they printed a. There's a company that's printing the Donald Duck comics. Carl Barks had done, and in one of the comics, there was a, a story where there was a, a fox character that's a farmhand, and they went back and they made the company after they did the first edition. They had to reformat the whole book to take that strip out because apparently that's Burr Fox. And I never even knew it was Burr Fox in that story. It has nothing to do with race, no, no Southern dialect or anything. And they're just totally wiping all of this stuff away if it's Song of the South related from the history. And uh, isn't that's what the film registry should be for is protecting a film that's being erased from the culture. What? And when we go over this with Song of the South, all of the things that uh, about it that are historical. 
Uh, and it's all, all that contribution to the culture is being erased. E even the song Zippity Doodah, they're claiming now that uh, the term Zippity Doodah is a reference to a character from vaudeville called Zip Coon from the 1840s. Now, who today, the woke culture, even knows anything about who a Zip Coon was, oh let alone associate it with that? They've just been told that, so they accept yeah. that that must be it. But that that wasn't where the song came from. But that's how history gets revised. And and for those that uh, are familiar with your Twitter handle um, at real underscore Ed underscore McCray, there on the screen, uh, that is um, explain your profile picture over there. That's that's James Basket. That was the actor who played Uncle Remus, and he was the first uh, black actor to win an Oscar, and it was for that role. And uh, we'll we'll get into why all, on all that, but. Uh, he, uh, the, the Uncle Remus stories are very important to Walt Disney, and and uh, he embodied that character, and that and everyone at the time they all accepted it that way. That the, I mean, that he was uh, Uncle Remus, so he they awarded him this Oscar, and it was an it wasn't the competitive Oscars. What everyone will point out now, well, he didn't get Best Actor. It was a a, a special Oscar for playing Uncle Remus, but the same Oscar. Of that type was also given to Edmund Gwen for playing Chris Kringle in Miracle on 34th Street. And those were the only two actors, I think, that ever got an award like that. And it was for those roles. Because for a lot of people, that performance Edmund Gwen did of Chris Kringle, that is Santa Claus for, for generations. And that's what they were trying to say with James Basket playing Uncle Remus. And they both got that award at the same ceremony. Uh, and that was the last time that an award like that was given to an actor for playing a role. And it was just those two men. And they always gave special Oscars to uh, child actors or for making a, uh, con a new contribution to uh, the, co the filmmaking. Uh, in all, Walt Disney won 48 Oscars. He's got the record. And a lot of them were for honor honorary technical things that he did. I mean, when, we did, when he did Snow White, they gave him an Oscar for being the first animated feature. And it was a, a tall, regular-sized Oscar with seven little Oscars. And Shirley Temple gave it to him. And... Uh, he, he uh, and he also won seven Emmys. Walt did, but uh, to to get into why Uncle Remus was important, the uh, Uncle Remus stories came from a man named Tro uh, Joel Chandler Harris, and he was this was back in the eighteen hundreds, uh, around the time of the Civil War, and he was a child born out of wedlock. He was uh, he red hair. He had red hair, and he had freckles and everything. So he was kind of an outcast. From society, and he, he was born in in Georgia, and the only people that would uh, welcome him in were were the slave community, and a lot of the the, the mentors in the slave community they went by names like uncle or aunt, and they would tell all these stories, and these became these were the stories, the Uncle Remus stories, and he invented the name of the character Uncle Remus because of, they were based on all these. Uh, Elderly people who told him these stories, and he uh, he he knew that uh, they needed to be written down, and no one was doing that. And uh, when when he grew up, Joel Chandler Harris uh, became a newspaper guy, and he started writing down all of these stories. And uh, what he had to say about it was uh, the Uncle Remus stories. He wanted to preserve in permanent shape the, these curious mementos of a period that will no doubt be sadly misrepresented by historians in the future. Now, isn't that uh, prophetic that he said that? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the Uncle Remus stories, they were based on stories that uh, were from Africa. And they were brought over by the slaves and they were Americanized. And some of the scholars say that the, the characters like uh, Br'er Rabbit and uh, Br'er Frog, they were based on the slave characters, and the Predators were based on the slave masters. And today, what, what, one of the, the things they complain about with Song of the South is there's the story of the Tar Baby. That's the most famous Uncle Remus story. And what that story is about is getting out of a sticky situation. And I read uh, one of the modern uh, interpretations of that, and it was by uh, that... Uh, Professor Skip Gates, remember that got uh, locked out of his house when Obama was president, and oh. they had the beer summit. Yeah, well, he the he's, police acted stupidly. Yeah, yeah, the police yeah. acted stupidly. Well, oh, I think he acted stupidly here because he <laughs> says that the Tar Baby is about uh, blackness getting on a white character, and uh, the, it, oh, gosh. trying but, but too listen, hard. Yeah, but listen, 
the 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 you can look at all these folk tales and everything, even the grimmest fairy tales, where they come from. And the oldest tar baby story comes from India. So how could it be about uh, getting blackness on somebody when it's from India, when it would have been they would have all been Indian, you know? Yeah. It had nothing to. It was about getting out of a sticky situation. Because that, that's what they, they make the, the fox. And that, what the tar baby story is about is the fox makes a, a little figure made out of tar, shaped like a man, and uh, a bear rabbit gets in a fight with it and he gets all caught up in the tar, and, and uh, bear fox comes out to uh, get him, and he the uh, rabbit has to think his way out of this. And uh, it had nothing to do with race when I was a kid. and the, They would sh still show the animated sequences on uh, the Disney Channel, and I took the tar baby to be like a snowman or a scarecrow. I never associated race with it. I mean, we, we I grew up in the country. We would make things like that. And it had nothing to do with race. And I just think you're thinking too hard to, to read that into it. But that was that's a big part of why the film is, is banned. And Joel Chandler Harris wasn't a racist. He In his newspaper, he was a staunch abolitionist. And during the Reconstruction, he would write about uh, how we had to get rid of the Klan, how the, the, uh, the North and South had to reconcile. Uh, you know, things like that. And some of that's in Song of the South, too. Uh, the, the main part of the story, it's about a, um, the, a, a boy and his mother go to stay at the grandmother's plantation because the parents are having marital problems. It has something to do with what he's put in his newspaper. We don't know what, but it has something to do with that. It's kind of vague. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the actors pay, playing the parents, they were really married in real life at the time. And, uh, but... Uh, for, until we got to this world culture stuff, there people right. were, were indebted that Joe Chandler Harris wrote all these stories down, and uh, that you can get a uh, copy of the complete ah. Uncle Remus stories. You can probably still find this book if it's still in print. But it had he, there were seven books in all. They and and they they started out being in the newspaper before there were comic strips. People would write things and they'd be in the newspaper, the, and it would be like an anthology. And that's how the, the they started. Then they'd collect them into a book, and. Well, yeah, is grew up with this book, with the, the Uncle Remus book. Right. Now, I remember when they re-released it, uh, the film uh, Song of the South. 1986. I, 19, I remember seeing that in the theater. Well, that was one of the most successful re-releases they'd ever done. It's always it been was, popular when it was re-released. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean it, it's, the, right. reason, the reason it got re-released was because they were uh, testing uh, for Splash Mountain. And we'll get into Splash Mountain, too. Oh, but, yeah, uh, we got a lot to talk about with Splash yeah. Mountain. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, and, and by the way, I put in the comments there, uh, if you scroll up there, let me um, I'm gonna do that there. Um, I'm going to repost it here. Stand by. In the comments right there is Ed's personal mission, which I just love, is <laughs> to get this movie nominated. And I'll, and I'll say... What inspired me to do this is uh, one of the animators at Disney was Ward Kimball, and he would always do things to kind of show up the studio. You know, he was a rascal <laughs> like that. And he, I could see Ward doing something like this. <laughs> so please, uh, it, now there are steps involved here. When you click on the, the link there in the comments, walk us through here, because you have to click on something once you get there, right? You have to give them your email address and answer a couple questions about the movie. and and, well, it's significant. Uh, We're going to get into that now, but uh, the, 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 the year the movie came out was 1946. You have to know right, the year. You have to know the year. Yeah. 1946. Thank you. I knew there was a trick there. Yeah. So if you nominate it, 1946, you have to know that uh, or else they just disregard your submission, I guess. And then give them a reason. What What are some good reasons uh, well, behind uh, nominating this movie, Ed? It was the first... Well, it was the first film that uh, really combined live action and animation the way that, that it is in the film. Mm -hmm. and uh, but, but the main reason, the first reason, is that uh, James Baskett was the first black man to get an Oscar for this film. And it also stars uh, the actress who was in uh, uh, song of, or, uh, Gone with the Wind that won mm -hmm. the, the best Oscar there, uh, Hattie McDaniel. And she plays a, a maid character in the film as well. But you, you have both of them in one film together. Wow! So, and you so also, Hollywood is trying to silence this this groundbreaking film for black actors. Got it. Yeah, and you you also have Nick Stewart was also a voice in the film. He was Br'er Bear, and with the money he made on Song of the South, he started a, a black theater company in California. And when they did uh, Splash Mountain, they had him come back to play Br'er Bear, 
And uh, he, with that money he made on that, he remodeled the 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 uh, the, the yeah the theater. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I mean, and it, his yeah. family, his his daughter just passed away this spring, and she was she's furious at what they're doing with uh, racing what her father did. I bet. And, and, and and the only reason there wasn't a sequel, you told me off yeah, air. Yeah, he passed uh, away, right? Yeah, yeah. James Basket passed away. He was Uncle Remus, and they yeah. see we. we we should go back a, just a little bit because because of World War II, they couldn't do the full features. They right, started this doing is fascinating. Yeah, they started doing package features. They, that's what they're known as. And uh, the the uh, they first the first one they did of these was called Make Mine Music, and they would they strung a bunch of short cartoons together. And when those were released on uh, home video in the nineties, one of them was removed from the the uh, feature because of Columbine. They were the first. Yeah, the the, <laughs> the first uh, short in the in the in this uh, package feature was based on the Hatfields and McCoys. And it was a song called "The Martins and the Coys." And you can find this on YouTube; it's still there. And uh, it was about these hillbillies that were shooting each other, and they ended up killing both sides of the families, mm -hmm. except for a, a, the, a, the daughter of one and the son of another. And uh, it, the the and through the whole thing, there's the ghosts up in heaven, like art. You know, go get him, go go kill her, get him, kill him, and and uh, it, it was, it's a comedy. It wasn't supposed to be taken seriously. So th they come together. They're going. You think they're going to shoot each other? Well, they fall in love, and then all the ghosts are all mad. Oh, they're, they're, this is terrible. But then the the punchline to the whole thing is now that they're married, they fight worse than all of the relatives did when they were alive. And and then and they, and the last shot, it shows. Uh, the, the ghosts all up in heaven on the clouds and they're all just cheering because they're fighting worse than they did. And this was, this was a famous song. You can find recordings of this song. And some of these songs, they would start from the Disney shorts and they would become popular songs or they would take a popular song and it would become a, a Disney short. With, with the, the World War II cartoons, when Donald Duck was in the military and everything, they did uh, one where he uh, had a nightmare what it would be like living in Nazi Germany. And the song for that was called In the Fuhrer's Face. And uh, this short is on YouTube. I checked before we came on. To, and this won the best Oscar of the short that year. Wow. And it was released on, home, on DVD uh, with, all the, with a lot of the World War, World War II cartoons. And uh, now they lament that it's out there. But I think it's important. It won an Oscar. It wasn't celebrating Nazis. It was showing how terrible it would, have, would be to live there. Right, and, it was, right. and all the caricatures in this, they are actual historical figures. It, the, the Emperor of Japan is one of them. Uh, Mussolini was there. Uh, Hermann Goering. Uh, and, but the woke people, they just think that these are racist caricatures. But these are characters of actual people. So can, can you touch on something you and I spoke about uh, offline where I guess, let's see if I remember this right, Ed. Yeah. That, that Song of the South ended up being half cartoon, half animation. Yeah, and that was because of these package features. Uh, he wanted to do a, a full feature of Song of the South. They didn't have the money to do that. Right. So he, he that's why he decided, well, we'll do the Uncle Remus part in live action and then do the shorts in, in uh, animation. But he was intending to do a whole series of these. It wasn't just right. going to be the one film. And that's how he... he, he uh, the, the actors he worked with in Song of the South, some of them were the, the crows in Dumbo that now are banned everywhere. Uh, James Basket oh. was the, was one of the crows, and so was Nick Stewart. And uh, for for the 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 normies out there, the the head the head crow, well, he's known as Jim Crow, but it was done as a stick it to the Jim Crow laws. It wasn't celebrating. They, they but this was only on the studio stuff. And uh, Con context does not matter to no, them. No, con yeah, yeah, it doesn't, but it should. And Jim Crow is voiced by the same actor who was Jiminy Cricket. And oh, if wow. you know, if you know the song, oh, if you, when I see an elephant fly, that's the same guy singing "When You Wish Upon a Star," and you wouldn't know that unless I pointed it out. Wow. And uh, it, it, that was, and it, if you think about it, if if the crows are black, doesn't that add more depth to how they uh, service the story of Dumbo because they're outcasts and they're the only ones that will friend befriend Dumbo and get him to believe in himself? Mm -hmm. And when when uh, Ward Kimball animated the crows. He made the he did base them on black dancers and things, but they were played by black actors. Right, <laughs> and, and and Wombat Mommy points out. I mean, it's almost as if they're erasing black people uh, from history. 
Well, it is. And, and you, Walt Disney was one of the only studios that was doing these empowering roles for black people back then. Because right. there would be a lot of... Short, they wouldn't even have uh, black actors voice characters that were black. Or they would do mean-spirited caricatures. And another thing that's kind of adjacent to this is uh, it, over at Looney Tunes, s some people started writing, why don't you do some black Looney Tunes characters? To uh, They wrote it to uh, Bob Clampett. And he never he said, well, I never thought of that before. Why, why don't we do some black Looney Tunes characters? And he did two black Looney Tunes. One was a parody of Snow White called Coal Black and the Seven Dwarves. And it's really a war, World War II cartoon. And... Uh, then and he did another one called uh, Red Riding Hood and the and the Jiving Bears, and both of these cartoons at one time, uh, you know, up through the nineties, they were on lists from all these historians, the best cartoons ever made. Well, now they've changed their tune. We can't talk about them because they might be racist. It, you look at them though, the the caricatures that they did for the dwarves for uh, the Cole Black cartoon, they're just as cartoony as the dwarves in Snow White. They're just black, it, it, even. Some of those dwarves in Snow White, they have a lip. Uh, you know, they have the lower lip. It's a caricature. It's mm -hmm. not done to be a, a mean-spirited thing. And, and that was, and Bob Clampett's intention was inclusion. And when they would do things like that and the Crows and Dumbo, they would go to the clubs where the black performers were and they would sketch what they were doing because they wanted to make it authentic. They weren't doing something mean-spirited. They were trying to be inclusive. But now you don't even get uh, any credit for that. And, and, uh, even with Song of the South, he brought in some experts to make sure people didn't think that it would be offensive to anybody. And uh, he had a, an author from the, the that lived in the South to make it a, a, the script feel authentically south, Southern. And he also had a, a academic come in to make sure they didn't use uh, anything that might be hurtful. There, there's no slang terms in the film. I don't even think anyone is even referred to as a Negro in the film. Or colored or anything like that and a lot of the films in hollywood they would use some of the things that are considered racial slurs now and uh, that's not in song of the south and song of the south uh the story is really about uncle remus as his mentor to this boy whose parents are in a separation and it's really a lot like what happened to the real life joel chandler harris where he was accepted into this the community and they mentored him with these stories and that's that's really a main theme in that film and several times in that film, you'll see uh, them take hold each other's hand, Uncle Remus and the little boy. And th you think about when this was made in the 1940s, we're told, oh, it's all this racist time, all this. Th wouldn't that make that, that they would have a shot where they're holding hands, wouldn't that make it more empowering for the time? You know, it's a bold statement. They weren't reading race into it. They were reading it as it was just a, a guy who happened to be black and he was mentoring this little boy. And even the grandmother whose plantation this was, there's a scene where she's talking with Uncle Remus. They're talking like they're equals. They're not, it's not subservient. People today are angry. Well, why are there black people living on a plantation in pro post reconstruction times? But that historically was accurate. A lot of the people that were slaves in the South, at the, you know, during the Civil War, before that, they stayed on the plantations and it was their children who moved away and, and lived, lived free lives. Because it was all they know. You, you see this in the Bible with, uh, the, the generation of the Jews that uh, left uh, Egypt where they were lost in the wilderness because they had this slave mindset. And and that's really what you, you go through all the history in our country with uh, racial things and slavery. They always tied a lot of it in with Moses and that, you know? So, so let me ask you this because it seems like it doesn't seem like it is reality that, 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 Issues of race in the last, what, 15 years or so in this country have been shoved down our throats. Yeah. They, we have been made to to discuss it, yeah. even, even though it hasn't even been the majority of us, the vast majority of us. Don't even don't even give race a second thought. And, then, and now they say that's racist not to give it a thought. I mean, a couple weeks ago. Right, right. But but here's my question to you. Yeah. Because you're going to find yourself in these positions where you are are having these uh, conversations thrust upon you about race in America. And and, and, and I'm going to put you on the spot here. Yeah, go ahead. Because, because let's say let's say somehow race becomes a, a topic 
uh, about whatever. Who knows? It's in everything now. <laughs> it's in everything now, right? And someone starts to say, well, that's racist or, or I don't know, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't put this in the, in the proposal because someone might be offended. Yeah. And that's what it's yourself, like now. Get yourself in. If you're in one of these conversations, maybe you bring up something like song of the South. And I guess my question to you, Ed, again, totally putting you on the spot on this. What, what is an elevator pitch, if you will, to convince someone that race is absolutely blown out of proportion. And let me explain to you how Song of the South is the opposite of what you think well, it is. How would I, you do that in the 30 second? I don't know if you can do it in 30 seconds, but it's like all, all these people that were civil rights leaders and things in film, they were involved in this film and they made uh, quotes about that. They wouldn't have done this film if they thought it was making fun of the race. And I always ask, how come whenever there's a minority character in a film now, that it's like that's got to represent the every one of that skin color, that race, nationality. It's not just a character. It, it, I you know I was going to say a couple weeks ago I watched the Tim Allen Santa Claus movie, mm -hmm. you know for Christmas, and you go back and look at that. There are characters in there of different races, and they don't draw attention to it. They're just there, and that's how it should be. And now when you have a film with with they always make a point we have to celebrate the they're this race or this uh, sexuality or it, it's become the, the defining thing of characters now. And it's probably the most boring thing about them because a character is about personality. It's not about what they look like or who they sleep with or anything like that. And, and, and it's really, it's all pushing an agenda now. And that's one reason films are the way they are now. So many of them, uh, it's become message over the story. And when, when Walt Disney was alive, it was always about, story compelling characters i would with song of the south with uncle remus i would also point out another film that walt made a few years later uh darby o'gill and the little people and it's about a storyteller who happens to be white and i always associated uncle remus with darby o'gill because both of them were elderly storytellers and they had these fantasy adventures with the characters in their stories and uh because people don't know what darby o'gill is now uh, they don't associate that way, but people would have known who Darby O'Gill was when uh, they did the Uncle Remus stuff and vice versa. Because Walt Disney really led the culture with a lot of these films that he made. And, and we'll have to uh, talk about Darby O'Gill sometime because I have the, the uh, a copy of the original script and has deleted scenes in it. <laughs> I also have the script of the television special that Walt did about Darby O'Gill. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And, and, and this is the first edition of the book that Darby O'Gill is based on. The second one. There were two books. This was the first volume, and this is the second. But this is really the one that Darby O'Gill comes from. It's what it's always. That's always been a favorite of mine. But you, the only way you can really get through on this stuff is you need to teach people about the history, or they need to look for it for themselves. And things have always found me about history. Uh, I saved this book from a garbage can at the library, <laughs> and this is one of the first uh, black history books, and it's written by a black man who would have known slaves firsthand, former slaves, and it goes through the whole history, for, starting in Africa, all through American history, and in, the, in this book, what he says the about the garbage can, it was in the library, and it, I was in college when I found that, and uh it used to be one of the major textbooks in schools about black history. And I mean, look, look how uh, thick that book is. It's not like it's a thin little book. And uh, he goes through the whole history where what he had to say about uh, Reconstruction, the Klan, and racism is where a lot of that came from was slavery artificially uh, put wages down for the poor whites. So they resented the, the slaves for that because the slaves, they, had, they saw it as a socialist system where everything was provided for them where they, they, uh, they had their health care, their food, their shelter, and the poor whites would have to pay for that at the lower wages. And uh, people probably will say saying that's racist, but he, he, he knew people that were there, and that was what they told him. And, and Hold he, that book he, up again. He uh, was this. born in uh, 1875, I think. This is fascinating. A story of the Negro there. And it's, uh, what, what is the author uh, again? Uh, Arna Bontemps. Okay. It's got illustrations and everything. You found that in the garbage can at a library. Yes, I did. The first thing that I thought of was if you told someone that that the autobiography of Frederick Douglass was that that's that that seems like the same act 
oh, they, that yeah, into yeah. a garbage can. Remember, these these are the people books. telling us that they don't want to ban books. Right, right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Because, because the descriptions that, that Frederick Douglass has in that book about what he witnessed, what he experienced as a slave, to think that we're just going to throw that away and, and act like it never happened? I mean, it, it is... Our well, reality now in America is not based in reality. And that is what is yeah. so tragic, is that we just we just act like well, it, it never happened. We, well, we, we can't if, even revisit because it's such a bad stain on American history. Well, remember you know, some a bad of, stain on American history. And if you don't learn it, you're going to mm -hmm. relive it all over again. And, and some of the experts, they'll say that uh, things that like Frederick Douglass wrote or Booker T. Washington, it was fiction. But, but think about this. They were, when they were alive, there were slaves and former slaves still alive running around. If they were making this stuff up, wouldn't they have been called out upon it at the time? I just, it's, it, it's, it's grotesque what, what happens yeah, to yeah. our history. And, I, and I've always been interested in this stuff because with the, with the history that I want you to know. Uh, or one of my first mentors, we would have phone conversations about this stuff and, um, we, all the stuff that gets banned, and he was—I was in my twenties then. He was surprised I knew all the stuff I knew at that time. That's and awesome, we, man. We, we just have these long conversations about banning everything. He did yeah. a—he did a comic strip uh, where uh, he had uh, the Klan versus a, a, a Pope, and uh, the, these little black kids try to—they're uh, running from the Klan, and, the, and they look for uh, salvation with this Pope character. And the Klan claims, well, they—they've got the burning cross, so they're the real Christians, and. The, the Pope defeats them. In the last shot, he had the, the Pope eating watermelon with these two little kids, and he got more flack for having the kids eating watermelon with this Pope character. And he started collecting pictures of characters in films and cartoons eating watermelons after that. He's like, well, every when they would go after him, he would say, well, everyone likes watermelons. They're very refreshing. But uh, he, he, it was, he didn't mean it as a racial thing right. then. He was doing something in an old school a uh, cartoon kind of a thing. I tell you, um, let, let me, uh, let me, let me, let me just give a couple of shout outs here. Yeah. Guys, I have never done this, uh, or received this. So I honestly have no idea. Um, but I just see Benjamin Flensborg. I don't know. Did looks like you gave a, a very generous, uh, gift there. Thank you very much. Uh, and same to Julie forever. Uh, my gosh, if I'm reading this stuff correctly, I have no idea. Like, it looks like the old tip jar has uh, oh, had well, some share, share the wealth. There's more Disney books to always get. Seriously. <laughs> uh, so, so thank you guys very much. I, I don't know how to acknowledge them other than just saying thank you. Oh, I would, yeah, thank, thank you. Thing. And and also, Julia, uh, or Julie Forever, um, she has a question, Ed, put you on the spot here. Yeah. Um, did you find anything on her grandfather i don't know if you i haven't looked it up yet uh okay. i was going i've got several books on walt disney and i was preparing for today i had to a lot of the stuff i haven't looked at it since i was in college and i wanted okay. to make sure yeah. i you, sounds like you i some, always uh, i have a memory like uh, glenn beck has a memory where i'll sometimes forget things when uh -huh. i'm telling the story and yeah. i wanted to make sure i've you know i that's why i stutter sometimes my mind's always going oh, I hear way you. ahead I hear you. That, that's where Wait. that's coming from i'm not thinking Wait, about you, what you to say See, Glenn has people look stuff up for him. So, see, oh, yeah, see, I do my. I'm an army of one. <laughs> I'm an army, army of, one. of one. Ed McCray. I, I really am. am. I, I, I know this. I know this. <laughs> and, and I'm so grateful for you and the knowledge that you're able to share uh, that is important that that there is a record of this stuff. It's kind of like the, the garbage can book, man. If, yeah. if you don't rescue it, if you don't get it recorded and, and protected, then it's going to vanish on us. Is there. I, I have, I have another one here related to South the Song of the South that you wanted to. Uh, well, we well, we we got a lot more we can say about it, but I. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we might we might not get to all of it today. Well, I'll, I'll show this. So I I got this out. I special. Uh, Floyd Norman is the first black animator at Disney, and uh, he well you can oh, see wow. the reflection of my lights there. Uh, he drew this for me because uh, he's an advocate for the film. There's a documentary about uh, Floyd. Uh, it was on Amazon at one time. I don't know if it still is. It was, it's called Floyd Norman, An Animated Life. And uh, he came to Disney in the 50s. And he grew up with Song of the South. And uh, he, he, uh, he's always loved those characters. He says he's nothing racist about them. 
he he said he points out that uh, di this film was not supposed to be a documentary about uh, what life was like in the, the South at that time. It was about Uncle Remus and the stories and the characters. And a lot of the animators that worked on Song of the South, they say that was the best animation they ever did. And I think where they mixed the live action with the animation, that is the best that's ever been. Uh, a lot of people think Roger Rabbit, where they shaded the characters. But you get you have to remember with with, uh, jo with uh, Uncle Remus, none of those characters were there. He, uh, James Basket had to imagine all those characters were there and interact with them. And there's one shot where he uh, lights the pipe of Br'er Frog, and you believe that they're both there occupying the same space. And it's all because of James Basket, how he's performing. And uh, F Floyd, uh, he did a comic strip in 1986 of Uncle Remus's Christmas. Now, there was a all, back since the 50s, there has always been a comic strip of Disney characters uh, that would go from Thanksgiving to Christmas, and they do a different three panels each day, and uh, they it, would, it was an annual thing. And this became Floyd's assignment, and he did a couple of them. He wanted to do an Uncle Remus's Christmas one. And uh, he got the studio to go, okay, in King Features and everything. He showed the film to uh, some uh, black audiences, and they loved it so much, they wanted to watch an encore. Because this is a film that people rarely see. Right. But, you know, and, well, a few years ago, they did a, a book collecting all of the Christmas comic strips. And not only did they not include Uncle Remus's Christmas in the historical section, they erased it ever existed, and uh, they and the thing is, they quote Floyd in the opening of this book in the introduction, where he's it's from an article where he talked about this Uncle Remus's Christmas comic, and that part's not in the front. It's like it never existed, mm -hmm. and that's part of history. Now, the last one of those that they did was uh, in 1997. They did a Little Mermaid's Christmas one, but that was a tradition that went back for decades. They did all the different uh, films. They'd have the characters interact like a shared universe as well. And uh, I, I just think it's cutting that out when he that going to those lengths to cut that out that it had never existed even in the historical section. That's really uh, that's where well, I think it's really started where they were the erasing that Song of the South ever existed. There was and a what year was that? Well, the the book that they printed it with, I think it was 2016, 2015. I think that the Trump election thing made everyone go nuts with this woke thing. It's mm -hmm. like they were all that triggered everyone going nuts. And it had nothing to do with that, but it it did to them. But as as you will explain in a future conversation, yeah. uh, this th this um, I guess uh, watering down of Disney or 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 taking it off the tracks um, began back in the nineties, right? Yeah, it was uh, it very gradual. But see, but see, the difference is. Back in the 90s, Roy Jr. was still there, and he cared and protected this stuff because this was his family uh, heritage. If he'd lived a few years longer, they probably would have put out Song of the South on a DVD because that was something he really wanted to do. I think he died in 2009, and that's really when things started going the way they are now. Yep. It, it's, yeah, it, but it just exploded around 2015, 16, somewhere in there. Yeah, and you had, with our culture, you have to remember... Uh, the the election of Obama and all this race stuff that came with it. And it wasn't, mm -hmm. it was the race baiting. It wasn't that he was black. It was just all these experts that would come yeah. out and make everything about race when it shouldn't have been. And that, I, when I grew up, we watched things like Steve Urkel. We never mm -hmm. thought about them being a black family. They were just a, a loving family. They were funny. Mm -hmm. uh, you, 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 you never thought of it being its own separate thing where it's different Cosby races show. and everything. Co Cosby yeah. show was yeah. the most popular. But, but look what they've done to Cosby. Mm -hmm. And and I, yeah. I what I think with Cosby, the reason that all that happened, somebody was holding that back for all those years because he, it only came to light when he spoke at that black college and he, he told them to do uh, things like, uh, why do the ghettos have to look the way they do? They didn't look that way when he was a boy. And he told them to, to clean up their communities and things like that. And he, he was talking about, uh, um, don't play a victim pretty much. Mm -hmm. Then yeah. shortly after that, all this stuff comes out that he was a sexual predator. Now they had to have known that if they, these were true allegations, they had to have known that back when they happened and somebody had been quiet all those decades. Mm -hmm. Cosby was very popular. Even before he did a sitcom, he did the fat Albert cartoons. Right. And uh, those were, now you got the song. Now you got the song in my head. Now I'm going to be walking. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, when, and when, when the live action movie of that came out about 20 years ago, I was in a mall with a guy who had a very liberal girlfriend and he, she would, she went nuts seeing the poster. Those were racist characters. Oh. Had no idea that Bill Cosby created them. They were based on people that he grew up with. And, uh, but and even with the stuff with the allegations with Cosby and he's convicted and everything, you still shouldn't erase the Cosby show as part of history. That was part of history. Is, what is so weird, man? I, yes. I mean, and where do you, the, the line is so arbitrary and it varies from offender to offender. Uh, yeah. And, and I just, I the, think the, that's the, by the design, societal though. punishment, the societal punishment that we inflict. It's just, it's all well, it's the, like, it's like with Walt Disney. Now they've gone in and digitally erased any photo of him where he's holding a cigarette. But Walt died of cancer, so why don't you make that a teachable moment? Don't smoke, or you'll die of cancer. Instead, well, you just erase that he did that. And, and if if he hadn't have died, he would have he would have built Epcot, and uh, he he probably would have lived another fifteen years based on the ages of the people in his family. You know, it, his uh, nephews and kids and or daughter and his uh, siblings. That, but. Why don't you make it a teacher moment? Why do you have to to erase everything? They they just yeah. tore a statue down in Arlington of the from the Civil War because it had slavery on the monument. But that was part of the history. That was, they a, were, that, was a, that was a reconciliation. Uh, yeah. Statue I, there. I, so I said, well, what are they going to tear down Robert E. Lee's house because that's don't Arlington don't Cemetery? Give, they buried. Give, yeah. People but don't it, realize that, so don't give them ideas. Yeah, I don't want to give them ideas. <laughs> so okay, Ed. All right, let, let's let's um. Let's give a preview of our next conversation, uh, which is uh, uh, throughout Disney's works are intertwined Judeo-Christian values. Is that accurate? Yeah, that, that is true. And that's from a lot of the things that he um, was that come from where he grew up and who mentored him and how he grew up and even his attitudes towards those things. And you, you'll see it in everything he did from the cartoons to the live action films, to the TV shows, to the theme park. I can't wait uh, to delve into that. Uh, is there is there other stuff here um, related to the early days of Disney uh, through Song of the South, uh, what, uh, 1946, right? On that, yeah. Uh, well, well, is we, there we, anything that we haven't covered here? Well, with the, with the package features, there were a few others. that, we, that, that uh, One of them, you, I'm sure you know who Sinclair Lewis was. Oh, gosh. He, um, he had, you can look him up. That's okay. Okay. The the name is very familiar. I, well, I feel like well Glenn Beck always different. talks about him, but you won't know this. Okay. He, he wrote one of the films that uh, one of the stories, one of the the package features, one of the the stories that it was based on. It was Bongo the Bear, and then okay. St. Clair Lewis wrote the story. And and uh, we didn't really touch on it with the package features. After he was doing the shorts, he did. Uh, he did the one with Make My Music and Melody Time where they were the short shorts all cut together. Some of those were shorts were salvaged from other th things he was going to do. And then he started doing uh, two 45-minute uh, featurettes put together as package features. And one of them was Mickey and the Beanstalk. That was going to be its own feature-length film. And they, they paired that with Bongo. And then they had Jiminy Cricket and Edgar Bergen kind of tie them together. And uh, they, did, uh, they were going to do Wind in the Willows as a feature. And they were going to do a Washington Irving feature, and those ended up getting cut together because they couldn't, they didn't have the money to finish things. Because, and that's how he got into live action when he did Song of the South. It was that was supposed to end up being a series, and they only ended up doing the one film, but uh, that was the, a success. So he was able to start making features again, uh, and that led to Cinderella. He also did. Uh, started doing live action films in England because after the World War II, you couldn't take the money your films made out of the of uh, England. So he had to make films there. So that's how he started doing live action films in, in England. The first one he did was Treasure Island. He did one with uh, uh, Robin Hood. Uh, these are all obscure now. There was uh, one called uh, uh, the, the Sword and the Rose. Uh, there was like five or six of them he did over there. And then he didn't get into live action here till about 1954. He started building that. The first film he did in live action in the United States was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And we, we can oh. get all into all that later, but the, I can't wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, uh, he uh, all of these uh, films that he he did that people don't know the forties to you know the forties films like they know Cinderella and all that. And they also a lot of people today think Disney was always this big successful enterprise, and it was really just a bunch of 
country kids from the Midwest that started this studio. They had a couple of failures and they built it up to what it's become now. But it, you know, this all what it is now isn't what it was even when Walt was alive, because uh, Disney almost disappeared after Walt passed away. But uh, we we so also so many times we could have lost the Walt Disney Company throughout history. You could have lost it when he died because he he was the Disney Company to a lot of people. Right. They were afraid that the stock would drop. You could have lost it when yeah. when Eisner took over. It could have lost. Jim Henson almost bought Disney back then. That's how poor Disney was. And, and what ended up happening later was Jim Henson was going to merge with Disney and they were going to install him as the Walt Disney figure of the company, but he died. Yeah. And uh, he was yeah. the, the closest thing to a Walt Disney figure there's been since Walt Disney. And when they brought John Laster and they, they did a lot of things with his deal because of what happened with Jim Henson and John Laster became sort of that, but he, he was never a pop cultural figure like Walt Disney and Jim Henson were. And we need to write this down. We need to talk about uh, John Lasseter and his exit, and and how that has um, really. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll get into that when we talk yeah, about we how things so got. Much, oh yeah, and and even with we didn't get with, with Splash Mountain, how that even became a ride. We'll get, we've got at least y'all yeah. two, three, twenty parts. I don't know, but um, we. Well, so let me just finish the thing with Splash Mountain because it, it ties yeah. in with. Uh, Okay. Okay. So, uh, Splash yes, Mountain. Sir. How that started was they were they had a ride at uh, Disneyland that was tied in with the Bicentennial and had all these animal characters in it, designed by Mark Davis. And it was mm -hmm. called America Sings, and uh, they had to find something to do with those characters. They wanted to put something in Critter Country uh, for a ride because uh, the country bears weren't popular in Anaheim, and and uh, there was talk to put this. Wait, this, wait, wait! This guy right here. Oh Big yeah, Al. They, Big Al. Big, Big, Big Al's not popular. How is that, that possible? This was in this. You know that wasn't even designed for Disneyland. Walt Disney was going to build a ski resort in the 1960s at Mineral King, and the environmentalists uh, were battling him the whole time. And that the Country Bears was going to be a show, kind of like what when we were growing up. There was Chuck E. Cheese where they'd have the characters. It, yeah. it would give you a show while you were eating dinner. That's what the Country Bears were designed for. And uh, but they did this America Sings thing, and they wanted to save all these characters. They wanted to do a ride there. They decided to do a splash ride. Uh, you know, and in Splash Mountains, the the uh, highest uh, ride like that with a flume that splashes, or it was. It's not there now, but uh, they had to pitch it to Michael Eisner. And when they were going to build it, they were going to call it the Zippity Doo Dah Run. And uh, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> thank you, Benjamin Flinsworth. Thank you. Again. So they, they were going to do this zippity doo dah run, and so Michael Eisner, he being the executive he was, he he the movie Splash had just come out. He wanted to call it Splash and put the Daryl Hannah character in this. That, that was a Disney movie, and they yeah. they had to talk him into what you can't have a Daryl Hannah character in Splash Mountain it would ruin the, the. So they kept it. We'll call it Splash. We'll call it Splash Mountain. That's how it got its name. And they they what they did was they did the like a version of all the stories through the ride. It's, it's a very vague of the animation parts and the tar baby was in the ride at the time. And they took Michael Jackson through the ride and he was a big Disney fan. He loved that. He, he thought that was hilarious. Having the tar baby there. It wasn't considered a racial slur like it is now. Oh. It, it really wasn't. And, and what the, the uh, Nick Stewart's family has said, where well, they're replacing this with princess and the frog for a ride. Uh, yeah. They, uh, why are they pitting both films together like there can only be one black Disney film? Why, why didn't they have both of them? And I don't really care for Princess and the Frog. We'll get into that sometime. But uh, I just think that uh, they could add both rides there. There's nothing racist about that ride and just racing the song. The song Zippity Doodah won Best Song that year as well. So, And that was a quintessential Disney song. And these, these uh, this Uncle Remus stories were just so important to Walt Disney he brought them out on his Christmas shows were the first things he did on television. And he would show them at the, the animated parts. He would show them at the studio Christmas parties for the families, the kids. And they would, they would uh, be in some of the episodes of his regular show. Uh, he did an episode about Joel Chandler Harris and growing up uh, for one of the re-releases of song of the South. No other film uh, studio head did this where they would do like bonus features for a weekly TV show. And Walt Disney was the only one that did that. And the the, the I, I just can't emphasize enough how my, how important this uh, 
James Basket performance of Uncle Remus was to so many people. Right. It, it, they, they really saw him as the embodiment of Uncle Remus. And when Walt Disney uh, advocated for him to get that Oscar, the elites said, well, that's not a dignified enough role to give an Oscar to a black performer. They should be a doctor or a lawyer or something. And uh, Walt was like, well, great. Are you, you, is anyone uh, doing a film with those parts for black actors? You know, it's, it, it's like the, the, the uh, phrase that uh, uh, oh, the, the lady that won the, the best Oscar for Gone with the Wind. I had Hattie McDaniel. She always said, I'd rather play a, a, a maid than be a maid. And, uh, you know, st stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. uh, but they had this this long meeting. It was the night before the Oscars. It went to four in the morning. And like uh, Betty Davis was fighting. You got you have to give James Basket an Oscar for this performance. And he was sick at the time. And they knew he was going to die. And uh, finally, the head of the, the Academy said, well, if they don't give him an Oscar, he's just going to go on the when they do the show. He's going to just tell everyone that they were so racist. They wouldn't give him an oh, Oscar for this performance. And they gave him the Oscar. And he died shortly after that. And his widow said, she just praised Walt Disney, what a friend he was. to J James Basket was only 44 years old when he died. So he was about our age when he was Uncle Remus. You know, wow. close to it. And he, his hair went white prematurely. He died of diabetes. But yeah. and he, he just loved playing that character. It, was, it wasn't anything racist. I just can't emphasize that enough because people are... Uh, supposedly offended by it. And it's right, right. Can we go back to... Uh, let, let's put a bow on this with Floyd Norman, who yeah. you mentioned earlier. Uh, you featured some of his uh, artwork there you held up for us. Wasn't he on The View? Yes, he was. Not too long ago. Defending 10, 15 years ago, it was uh, to tie in with uh, The Jungle Book. And even now in some of the history books for Disney, they're trying to say The Jungle Book's racist. Because no, uh, this is what I don't understand. Yeah. It's always these uh, leftist people that are always saying these things are racist, but aren't, they're assuming the apes are the black people. And Louis Primo uh, was Italian. He wasn't black. Now, Louis Armstrong wanted to be King Louis, and thank God he wasn't, or that would be banned now, because Louis Armstrong was a black jazz performer. Right. But he was on The View, and he, he, he knew Walt wasn't racist because he worked with Walt. And uh, the, all these things about Walt being racist and, and anti-Semitic and sexist, that were all, they were all lies that came out of the studio strike in 1941. And mm. they, PBS did a four-hour uh, documentary about Walt Disney, and they smeared him. They interviewed all these people saying things like that. And it's not true. Because a lot of the, his closest uh, people at the studio that he trusted working on his films, they were Jewish. And this was in the early days of the studio as well. The directors, uh, the Sherman brothers that did uh, the, a lot of the songs for the theme parks and the films. Walt Disney uh, personally, they personally worked for Walt Disney. They didn't work for the studio. And uh, they, they they were like, uh, he treated them like sons. Um, Bob Sherman was in World War II and uh, he got injured and he walked with a cane and Walt went out of his way doing things for him. They put a, a rocking chair in his office. It was Walt's personal rocking chair from his, his uh, other second home. And uh, they, they uh, he, he let him, he let Bob stay at his house a couple of times, the, the second home. And he supplied a golf cart for Bob because he knew Bob had a hard time walking with his cane. Now there's the, there's the film, uh, saving Mr. Banks. And I will tell you that whole, the whole story is made up. Walt wasn't at the studio when P.L. Travers came to visit. And it, that was on purpose. That, that's all fictionalized. But she was a nasty woman like that. <laughs> she, she was not a very uh, nice person to work with. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, go back to uh, Floyd Norman, though. He <laughs> defended uh, in the face of the view going after Walt's legacy. Joy Behar that kept, she kept goading him like that. Well, that's what I heard. And, and this and, is on YouTube. This is yeah. a fascinating interview. Whoopi Goldberg is there in the background, nodding her head, smiling. It's probably the only thing that uh, we agree on with, with with me and Whoopi, because she she doesn't want these things banned too. She wants to bring them back, and I know for a fact she collects what she calls negrobilia, because I know people who have sold her things on eBay, that, like oh, with wow. the salt and pepper shakers, where they'd be a, a an aunt and uncle black person and things like that. That she collects that stuff. That's part of our history. And uh, I, I would, she said she would like to see the Crows and Dumbo merchandise and bring back Song of the South. And she did some introductions on some of the Looney Tunes DVD sets that first came out that had some of the 
cartoons with the black characters in them. Whoopi Goldberg. Yeah, and, and now look at what she's done doing since then. I don't know if she still feels that way, mm -hmm. but a lot of the historians wanted to release this stuff too. But uh, the way things are, they've all kind of sided with the wokeness now. Even if you say the word woke, you they come after you. I when I was proposing this, uh, putting Song of the South in the registry, I posted it in some of the animation groups I was still in, and they turned it into a whole thing about ra being racist because I said the word woke. And they wanted me to delete the word woke from the tweet, and I wouldn't oh, do it. Oh my. Or, uh, post and uh, some of the groups, they all come out and they will publicly call me a racist all the time and I am not a racist <laughs> and and I don't know why they're allowed to character assassinate people like that but that's what they do they will they will probably just try to discredit this because it's Ed McRae telling these stories and well I don't uh, even we, know, I learned a lot of these stories I've just soaked in that my whole life you know well, we appreciate you, Ed, and, <laughs> and you, you are a wealth of knowledge, uh, especially when it comes to uh, Walt Disney history and history of uh, his company and his legacy. And you are one of the important voices who is preserving that for us. And thank I you. didn't even realize it growing up that that would be something I would be doing. And that's what that's like one of these little side things. And I, I just grew up getting books in the library about Walt Disney. There weren't very many of them. And uh, I, I dug one out here. This is this was the first book I ever read on Walt Disney. I got from the public library. Oh. And, uh, I was going to mention with these, they wrote. There were always these series of books about different historical figures that they would have in libraries for kids, so they would read them. You you can grow up to be like these people, right? And and it wasn't just this was like the only one that was an entertainer like that. But our, our high school or our elementary school library, we had one on Henry Winkler and Bill Bixby, the you know the actors. Wow. And they, and they did one. There was one on Doctor Seuss, and they, they they you know there was a lot of them on athletes and things like that. But they don't have these books around anymore. And, yeah, yeah. And, I, oh, I mean, you know, you know, if you go to any public, any, and I mean any public library today, I don't care how big of a city, how small of a town. Look at the featured books in the kids sections, especially. Yeah. And then, then oh the, my gosh, it's it's when, when you get it's you get into debates with people on it that are on the left, they'll say we're making it up, or that's not in the book, or it's a guy. It, that's context. They won't let us have context, but we have to have context why it's okay to show these these uh, sexually sexually explicit pictures to uh, elementary age kids. <sighs> So true. So true. Okay. Uh, I saw um, at least somebody was asking when part two is going to be here with Ed as we go through the history of Walt Disney and his legacy. Uh, we haven't scheduled that yet, but be watching well. um, my Twitter account at Keith Malinak. Um, you can uh, you can see that uh, I'll post it as soon as I get this scheduled with Ed and, and we will. We will we will do this again. We've got so we've much barely stuff. scratched the surface. Barely scratched the surface. But Ed, thanks for making time today, and I appreciate everybody in the chat and the donations. My gosh, y'all are incredible. I, well, if, they, if these are popular, we'll just keep doing more of them. I have the stories. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, Ed McRae, uh, follow him on Twitter at real underscore Ed underscore McRae, and uh, and and we'll be in touch again soon, y'all. Thank yeah. you so much, and and I hope that uh, everybody. Here has a great weekend and I'm glad you enjoyed it, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Thank you, buddy. You're welcome. <laughs>